السلام عليكم ام بروفيسور دكتور حيدر جواد مبارك اول بريزنت تو يو ناو ريفيجن تو اناتومي اوف ذا بيرينيوم ان كونسيدريشن تو براكتيكال اسبيكتس اوف ذا بيرينيوم اي ثينك ذات اناتومي از ان ابلايد ساين اند يور ليكتشر Uh, and the theory lecture of perineum will be uh, better understood in consideration to practical aspect of this subject. First, I want you to know what is the term perineum. Perineum is the space which is diamond in shape, as you can see here. The diamond shape space that is located deep to the skin of the lower trunk. So if you remove uh, the skin in this region, in male or in this region, in female, you will uh, find deep to the skin the perineum in uh, such a diamond boundaries. And therefore, if you consider uh, uh, superficial boundaries or Uh, surface boundaries of the perineum, you have to say that the perineum is bounded in male anteriorly by the scrotum, while <coughs> in female, sorry, it is bounded anteriorly by the mons pubis, uh, while posteriorly the perineum is bounded by the buttock, both in male and female, and on the sides, the uh, surface boundary of the perineum are the medial aspects of the upper thigh. So this is the perineum. This is one, what is meant by the perineum. It is the space deep to the skin in this region, in the lower trunk between the two upper thighs. And what I have just enumerated are considered to be cutaneous boundaries. If you want to know what are the deeper boundaries of the perineum, actually the uh, diamond perineum occupies the pelvic outlet, which is called inferior pelvic aperture. That is also diamond in shape, just like the shape of the perineum. So the deeper boundary of the perineum is the uh, pubic symphysis and body of the pubis anteriorly. This region contains uh, the inferior aspect of the symphysis of pubis contain a ligament, which is called inferior pubic ligament or called arcuate ligament. This is the boundary anteriorly of the perineum, and this is the boundary of the pelvic outlet also. The coccyx posteriorly is also the boundary, while on the sides, the boundaries of the perineum, and uh, which are the same of the pelvic outlet, are the inferior pubic ramus, ischial ramus, ischial tuberosity, sacrotuberous ligament. So these are the deeper boundaries of the perineum, which are uh, the same of boundary of the pelvic outlet or inferior pelvic aperture. Uh, this figure shows a coronal section into the pelvis. You know, this is a thigh. This line represents the thigh. And uh, this is also the thigh. This is the skin, of course, of the thigh. And this is a coronal section The coronal section, you know, uh, divides the uh, body into anterior and posterior half. So in that coronal section, these are the thigh, and this is the skin in between the two upper thigh. Uh, and so this is the skin of the lower trunk. And the space between this region of the skin, or deep to this region, which is this region, is the perineum. So you can see that above you have the true pelvis or lesser pelvis, which is containing the uh, urinary bladder, prostate, and male, and both the urinary bladder and the prostate lies on the levator ani muscle, which is uh, the muscle of the pelvic floor. I think you know from your uh, lecture of pelvic walls that the lesser pelvis or the true pelvis, <coughs> sorry, is uh, have a walls, a lateral wall, the lateral wall of the lesser pelvis 
is produced by this muscle, which is peri uh, obturator internus. This is obturator internus from the lateral wall of the pelvis, of the true pelvis. While the true pelvis has a floor, which is called pelvic diaphragm, that is formed by levator, any muscle, and coccygeus muscle. So, uh, this is the cavity containing granular bladder and the prostate, the cavity of the true pelvis. And you can see that the floor of the true pelvis, which is levator, any, and coccygeus, from the upper boundary of the perineum, that's to say, another word, the perineum is inferiorly limited by the skin of the lower trunk between the upper uh, medial side of the thigh. But this perineum, which is limited below by the skin, is limited above by the muscle of the pelvic floor, which is levator any and coccygeus, forming the floor of the true pelvis. So this is the perineum, and you can see what is present inside the perineum. And this is in female, another figure for coronal section. Also, again, this is a thigh, and this is a thigh, between the skin between the uh, upper medial side of the thigh uh, is the, uh, uh, deep to it is the perineum. This is the perineum, and you can see that the upper limit of the perineum, or the roof of the perineum, is levator any muscle which is the muscle of the floor of the pelvis. This is the urinary bladder and uh, the true pelvis of female. You can see obturator internus from the lateral wall of the true pelvis, while levator any and coccygeus from the floor that is also forming the roof of the perineum. I think by now <coughs> you know what is perineum, the space of perineum. This is a sagittal section into the true pelvis. You can see this is the body of the pubis is uh, showing the uh, symphysis of pubis here anteriorly and this is the sacrum section, mid sagittal section into the sacrum. And here I want to revise the walls of the true pelvis. You can see that the true pelvis have anterior lateral wall by this muscle, which is obturator internus, while the true pelvis have posterior lateral wall, which is produced by piriformis. In addition to these walls, the anterior lateral wall and the posterior lateral wall, the pelvis, the true pelvis, has a floor. This is the floor. So you have walls, anterior lateral, posterior wall, posterior lateral, and a floor. The floor of the pelvis is called pelvic diaphragm formed by coccygeus muscle posteriorly and levator any anteriorly. And the perineum is located below the pelvic diaphragm here. This is the perineum, below the pelvic diaphragm. <coughs> also, <coughs> sorry, this perineum, the diamond shaped perineum, could be divided into anterior triangle and posterior triangle by imaginary line connecting the ischial tuberosities, an imaginary horizontal line or a transverse line, or called interest ischial spine. The anterior triangle is called urogenital triangle because it contains the uh, organs of urination and uh, the urethra and the genitalia while the posterior triangle is called anal triangle because it contains the anal canal. And this figure shows also this subdivision of the uh, perineum by the imaginary interischial transverse line. The anterior triangle is called urogenital while the posterior is called anal. Actually, the anterior triangle in female, the urogenital, contain the external genitalia of female. And uh, in male, it contains part of the external genitalia, which is the root of penis, in addition to part of the scrotum. Not all of the scrotum is here, but in female, it contains the whole uh, external genitalia of female. While the posterior anal triangle contains uh, the anal canal in the middle, and on the sides of it are two 
deep fossa that are called ischiorectal fossa. So, <clears throat> uh, you can imagine that this muscle now, on the size of the anal canal, is levator any, the muscle of the pelvic floor and coccygeus. Again, this is uh, the same uh, figure that shows the urogenital triangle containing the external genitalia in female and the anal triangle. So, before considering uh, these two triangles, the anterior triangle, urogenital, and the posterior triangle, anal triangle, I have to consider some important structures here in order to identify the region and then uh, we can talk about details. First, there is a fibrous nodule here, which is very important. This fibrous nodule uh, lies just behind the imaginary interischial spine, uh, interischial line. This fibrous nodule is called perineal body. You can see that the perineal body lies about one and quarter centimeter in front of the anus, and it is behind the vagina in female. What is the importance of this uh, perineal body? The perineal body provides attachment for many muscles here in the perineum. And because of that, sometime during labor, when the baby head gets out of the vagina, the large head of the baby may lead to rupture in the perineal body, a posterior rupture in the perineal body. And if the perineal body is ruptured, all the muscles attached to it will be weak. And so, uh, although you will suture this rupture, but later on you will have weak perineal muscles, weak pelvic diaphragm, including levator any. And because of this, this uh, consequent weakness due to rupture of the perineal body by the exit of the head of the baby, out of the vagina, after labor, you may have prolapse of the uterus, prolapse of the rectum, prolapse of any of the pelvic viscera due to rupture perineal body leading to weakness and the muscles attached to it. This is the first structure that I want you to identify before going into the details of the urogenital triangle and anal triangle. The other structure, which is this one, this is a ligament which is called anococcygeal ligament. I think uh, you gave me the right to say anococcygeal ligament. It extends from the anus to the coccyx. And this ligament is um, also important for uh, attachment of the uh, mu muscles around the uh, anus, which are the extrinsic anal sphincter. Muscles attached to the perineal body are rested there. And they are demonstrated in this figure. And it will be a waste of time to enumerate it uh, now. You can read it later on, and you can enumerate it. And probably it carries some kinds of uh, clinical significance due to the rupture. This is a figure showing the head of the baby exit out of the vagina. And you can see how tear could occur there, resulting in damage to the uh, perineal body. And so, as a management for that, if the obstetrician find that the head of the baby is so large and tear is possible because when the head is at the uh, outlet of the vagina, the, the obstetrician will see that the region is becomes so tense, so he will uh, the obstetrician will produce artificial, a surgical incision here on the side, which is called episiotomy. And by that, uh, the obstetrician will allow exit of the head out of the vagina without uh, uh, a possibility of rupturing in the mid region and thus avoiding injury to the perineal body. Of course, this surgical episiotomy, uh, surgical incision, could be repaired and 
by suturing and it will not lead to a weakness but if you didn't that the episiotomy the rupture that may occur in the midline damaging the perineal body re resulting subsequently into uh, prolapse of many of the pelvic viscera so by that identification of the perineal body and the anocoxygeal ligament I will start describing details of the uh, triangles, the interior the triangle. We said that the interior triangle is called urogenital triangle, while the posterior triangle is called anal triangle. Now I will consider the anal triangle that contains the anal canal in the middle, and on the sides of it are two deep fossae which are called ischiorectal fossae. Then after completing the anal triangle, I will discuss the urogenital triangle. So let's go to the anal triangle now. Again, this is a coronal section and the anus. You can see the anal canal. <coughs> this coronal section shows uh, is in the region of the anal triangle and it shows the anal canal in the middle and on the sides of it is ischiorectal fossa on that side and that side you can see that uh, if we want to revise the anatomy of the anal uh, canal you can see that the anal canal is surrounded in its upper two-thirds by a, a sphincter which is called internal anal sphincter while the whole anal canal is surrounded by extrinsic anal sphincter that is divided into three parts deep part of external sphincter superficial part of external sphincter and subcutaneous part of external sphincter and you can see here uh, the so-called white line of Hilton which is uh, lying at the junction of the upper two-thirds of the anal canal and the lower one-third of the anal canal or it is at the junction of the superficial and deep uh, external anal sphincter. And in between the <coughs> internal anal sphincter and external anal sphincter, you may find this cut, uh, which is called conjoined cut, conjoint longitudinal cut here and there. And you can see this conjoint longitudinal, longitudinal cut giving fibrous septum to the skin of the buttock. The most upper septum from the conjoint tendon is called perineal fascia. This perineal fascia form a boundary between it and the skin of the buttock of a space which is called perianal space. This space is very important which is the space between the skin of the buttock on the side of the anus and the perineal fascia that extends as a fibrous tissue from the conjoint longitudinal tendon. Why this perianal space is important? And just concentrate that I'm saying perianal, not perineal. Perianal. This perianal space between the skin of the buttock on the side of the anus superficially and the perineal membrane, the perineal fascia, perianal fascia deep, this perianal space contains fat and the fat here is in form of rooms or small uh, locally that are surrounded completely by fibrous tissue septa. And so why this is important here? This is important because of the following clinical point that sometime a hair follicle around the anus may be infected and this infection will lead to accumulation of pus and thus the pus will be in one of these rooms or loculi of fat in the perianal space and because the loculi are enclosed by fibrous tissue the pus will not have a space and so tension will occur on the fibrous tissue of the loculi and so the pus will produce severe pain this is called perianal abscess in the perianal space due to infection of the hair follicle. The patient will not even able to sit on his buttock because of pain 
resulting them from pus localized in these loculi of fat. And therefore you have to open this abscess, the perianal abscess, surgically in order to evacuate the pus there. In comparison to the loculi, which is completely surrounded by septum in the perianal space, the ischiorectal fossa on the side of the anal canal also is filled with fat, but the fibrous tissue here do not or does not form a complete septa around the fat locally. So pus here is not painful. Large amount of pus may be collected here without uh, feeling any pain. And sometimes uh, the pus, because it will be collected and the patient will not feel pain, may rupture from there and get out of the anus. And thus there will be a canal here between the pus and the ischiorectal fossa and the anal canal, which is called um, fistula in anal. Actually, how, how the pus reaches the ischiorectal fossa, this is a very important question. Sometimes the pus in the uh, loculi of the perianal space will uh, rupture to outside. And this is called perianal sinus. You find that here you have in the skin a small opening and pus is discharging, which is called perianal sinus. But uh, this pus will infect other follicle here and then other follicle here and other follicle here. And so you will, there will be a, an infection in the ischiorectal fossa. So here infection will be open to the anal canal. So you will have an opening in the anal canal connected with the pus here and the ischiorectal fossa, and that uh, uh, pus here is connected with, the, with the, these regions uh, uh, containing pus, and there is a, an opening here in the skin. So you'll have opening there in the skin and opening there. So this is a perianal uh, and an anorectal fistula. If it is only opened here, it is perianal absence, uh, perianal sinus, but if it is not opened and painful, this is perianal abscess. The abscess, if it is open to outside, this is a sinus with one opening. But an opening here with an opening here and a tract from the skin to the anal canal is called fistula in anal. The important thing is to know what are the boundaries of the ischiorectal fossa or space, which is a very large space. You can imagine that the boundary of the ischiorectal space medially is the anal canal below, and also medially is the levator ani above. You know levator ani is a muscle of the floor of the true pelvis. So if you are asked what are the boundaries of the ischiorectal fossa, you will say the anal canal, uh, medially, the uh, boundary of the ischial fossa medially, below is the anal canal, and above is the levator any muscle of the pelvic diaphragm. Uh, you can say also medially, not anal canal, you can say external anal sphincter, it is the same. And also the uh, levator any is enclosed by fascia, which is called inferior fascia of pelvic diaphragm. So you can say external anal sphincter medially and below, and inferior fascia of the pelvic diaphragm medially and above, or fascia covering, covering uh, levator any. You can see that levator any is covered by fascia above and below. The above fascia is called superior fascia of pelvic diaphragm, and this is inferior fascia of pelvic diaphragm. Both fascia plus the levator ani and coccygeus form the pelvic diaphragm. So, boundaries of the ischiorectal fossa medially is the anal canal with the sphincter below and levator ani with the inferior pelvic fascia above. What is the boundary laterally? The boundary laterally is the obturator internus muscle. Obturator internus muscle. And also, the boundaries medially is part of the ischial tuberosity that is not covered by obturator internus muscle. And in this region, in, th in that topic, the lateral boundary of obturator internus, I want to go back to the previous figure.
You can see <coughs> this half true pelvis done by sagittal section at the pubic symphysis anteriorly and the mid of sacrum posteriorly. We said that <coughs> the true pelvis, which is the lesser pelvis, <coughs> sorry, the true pelvis or the lesser pelvis containing the rectum, sigmoid colon, uterus, the true pelvis is have boundaries <coughs> which are anterior laterally the wall is obturator internus, posterior laterally is piriformis, and the floor is levator any and posteriorly coccygea. So notice that obturator internus is forming the anterior lateral wall of the true pelvis, and this is only the upper part of obturator internus. Uh, below the floor, below levator any, also you can see obturator internus because there, are, there is two parts in obturator internus. One part of it seen above the levator any and the other is below and I will show you that here. Look to this figure. This is the urinary bladder, prostate. This is the floor, levator any. And this is the wall, obturator internus of the true pelvis. So you can see obturator internus could be seen from the floor, from there, from the true pelvis, I'm sorry, the upper part of obturator internus from the lateral wall, anterior lateral wall of the true pelvis. But also you can see part of obturator internus below levator any, below the floor of the pelvis. And so this part, the inferior part of obturator internus, from the lateral wall of ischiorectal fossa. So this yellow color is the ischiorectal fossa. It is bounded laterally by obturator internus and part of ischiorectal fossa. Back to our figure. So the medial boundary of the ischiorectal fossa, uh, the medial boundaries are uh, Anal canal, medially and below, levator any and inferior fascia of pelvic diaphragm, medially and above. While the lateral boundary is the lower part of obturator internus and part of the skeletal velocity. <coughs> you can see that the lateral wall of the ischiorectal fossae contain a facial canal which is called the pudendal canal. This facial canal attached to the lateral wall of ischiorectal fossae, attached medially by the perianal fascia, which is extension from the conjoint longitudinal cord. This perianal fascia is attached to the medial aspect of the facial canal, which is a pudendal canal. And also this facial canal is attached to Fascia covering obturator internus, which is called obturator internus fascia laterally. And superiorly, the pudendal canal, this facial canal, so a fascia which is called lunate fascia that ascend up in a crescentic pattern, and because of its crescentic, crescentic pattern, it is called lunate fascia to be attached to the inferior fascia of pelvic diaphragm. So the pudendal canal is a canal, a facial canal, lying on the lateral wall of ischiorectal fossae, and it is attached medially to the perianal fossae, lateral to obturator internus fascia, and above it is attached to lunate fascia that extends up and attached to inferior fascia, fascia of pelvic diaphragm. This pudendal canal contains internal pudendal vessels and pudendal nerve. <coughs> so, we had finished boundaries of the ischiorectal fossa medially and laterally. What about anteriorly and posteriorly? This figure shows also the ischiorectal fossa. This is the ischiorectal fossa. It shows that posteriorly the ischiorectal fossa is bounded by gluteus maximus muscle and by sacrotuberous ligament 
that the muscle, the gluteus maximus, is partly originating the from sacrotuberous ligament. So the posterior boundary of the ischiorectal fossa is the gluteus maximus muscle and sacrotuberous ligament that are shown in this section, which is a sagittal section in the ischiorectal fossa. This is the pubic symphysis. And so the posterior boundary is gluteus maximus and sacrotuberous ligament. And I think this figure also shows uh, that configuration. This is the ischiorectal fossa. You can see posteriorly it is bounded by this muscle, which is gluteus maximus muscle. And also uh, here you can see that this is the sacrotuberous ligament bounding posteriorly the ischiorectal fossa. So, Posterior boundary is gluteus maximus and sacrotuberous ligament. What about the anterior boundary? The anterior boundary, I think it's very logically to know that the anterior boundary of the ischiorectal fossa is the urogenital diaphragm itself from the anterior boundary of the ischiorectal fossa. This is the ischiorectal fossa on the sides of the anal canal and this fossa is bounded anteriorly by the urogenital triangle, the anterior triangle of the perineum. And here, this is the urogenital triangle. We will talk about it later on. And you can see that the anterior boundary of the ischiorectal fossa is the urogenital triangle. Actually, the ischiorectal fossa extends slightly above the urogenital triangle or deep to the urogenital triangle and this slight extension is called anterior recess of ischiorectal fossa. Even the space here deep to gluteus maximus is called posterior recess of ischiorectal fossa. Some anatomists say that the ischiorectal fossa show posterior recess deep to gluteus maximus and anterior recess deep to the urogenital triangle. Of course, we will talk about the urogenital triangle later on uh, this structure is called um, uh, urogenital diaphragm and so we may say that the anterior recess lies deep to the urogenital diaphragm not to the urogenital triangle they are the same terms this figure also shows that the ischiorectal fossa may have an extension posteriorly deep to gluteus maximus and sacrotuberous ligament, which is a posterior recess, and may extend anteriorly for a short distance uh, above the urogenital triangle or above the urogenital diaphragm, which is the anterior recess. The last topic that should be considered about the uh, ischiorectal fossa after the boundaries and uh, recesses that is the topic of contents of the ischiorectal fossa what is present in the ischiorectal fossa and here is an enumeration for the content of the ischiorectal fossa with slight description of course the main space of the ischiorectal fossa contain fat as you know but inside the fat uh, are many nerves and vessels and i think you have to go to your lecture <coughs> and depend on the uh, enumeration of structures, uh, structural contents of the ischiorectal fossa according to your lecture uh, or according to that. I, I'm preferring what is enumerated in your lecture. You can see that even the pudendal canal uh, content, which are the internal pudendal vessel and pudendal nerve, are also considered as contents of the ischiorectal fossa, fossa. You can see that the pudendal canal is sometimes described as alclock canal. So let us uh, uh, remember or study content of the ischiorectal fossa depending on your lecture. Uh, practically it does not make difference. But uh, in that term, when you will go to your lecture, you may find details about the pudendal nerve and I'm putting here uh, branches of the pudendal nerve uh, in text and um, uh, pudendal nerve of course run in here in the pudendal canal and this is a figure uh, for branches and origin of the 
if you don't know, but this is a theory pr uh, topic. I said this is a practical session, but may this help you, may this figure, I think it's very clear and uh, you can read the Pudandan nerve uh, on it. It's originated from a two, three, four sacral nerve passing through the greater sciatic foramen and then across the sacrotuberous uh, ligament entering into the lesser sciatic foramen and then it run in the pudental canal it gives the following branches one two three four and so on so this is a summary to the pudental nerve and also uh, you may find in your lecture description to the uh, internal pudental vessel or artery but this is a summary I'm, 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 if you want to take it take it or you can depend on your uh, topic uh, internal pudental artery in the lecture and again this is uh, a figure that may help you to understand, to understand the internal pudendal artery. It is a branch uh, from the anterior division of internal iliac artery. Also, it passes through the greater sciatic notch into the buttock, just like the pudendal nerve across the uh, sacrospinous ligament, and then enter the pelvis or re-enter the pelvis with the pudendal nerve through the lesser sciatic foramen and running in the pedantal canal giving the following branches one two three four and so on so by that we had finished description to uh, details of anatomy of the ischiorectal fossa considering the boundaries of it contents of it and clinical points of it and now we can pass to the anterior triangle, which is urogenital triangle. As I said before a while, that this figure shows the urogenital triangle. This is the urogenital triangle. You can see this is the anterior recess of ischiorectal fossa that extends deep or above the urogenital triangle. So what is the urogenital triangle? It is this space which is bounded on the sides by the ischiopubic rami. This is the inferior pubic ramus and ischial ramus and ischial tuberosity. And anteriorly by the pubic symphysis from behind by the imaginary horizontal line. This is the urogenital triangle. This triangle is closed by a triangular soft tissue which is this one, all these structures, the soft tissue for closing the uh, urogenital triangle. So what is the composition of this soft tissue? From deep to inside, the soft tissue that is closing the urogenital triangle is formed by, number one, this fascia, which is called superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. This is it. This is the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. Number two is the inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. And this inferior fascia, and this is the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. The inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm have a synonym, another name, which is perineal membrane, not perianal, perineal. So the first is the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. More superficial is the inferior fascia of uh, urogenital diaphragm, which is called also as a synonym perineal membrane. And more superficial is membranous superficial fascia, which is called Collie's fascia. These three fascia, the superior and inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, and the Collie's fascia, which is a membranous superficial fascia, the three fascia are uniting here in the line in the region of the imaginary line between the ischialotiobrosity. These three fascia unite here posteriorly. The three of them. This is the union of them. And these three fascia are attached to the sides of the ischiopubic rami. And these three fascia encloses, as you can see, two spaces. The space between the superior and inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, this space, is called deep perineal space. 
while the space between the inferior fascia of your genital diaphragm and the colis fascia, this space is called superficial perineal space. You can see that here, the deep perineal space between the superior and inferior fascia of your genital diaphragm contain the muscle that encloses the urethra, which is sphincter urethry muscle, and a transverse muscle, which is called superficial transverse perineal muscle. While the deep space, the superficial sp and these both are content of this deep space, and uh, and the superficial space contains superficial transverse perineal muscle and root of penis or clitoris. So now I want you to know a term which is urogenital diaphragm. When you want to say what is the urogenital diaphragm, you have to say. The urogenital diaphragm is formed by the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, which is the perineal membrane, and the muscle, which is sphincteric urethra and trans deep transverse perineal muscle. These three form the urogenital diaphragm. Okay. While considering these structures that are closing the urogenital triangle and thus these structures as they contain three fascia they form in this triangle a deep perineal space and superficial perineal space now we will have to pass into details of the deep perineal space and details of the superficial perineal space <coughs> before passing into these details i want to show you why I am putting this arrow. If you will go back to the, uh, to the same figure that I had demonstrated above, you will find that I'm putting a yellow spot here that is pointed by the red arrow. I'm interrupting the colis fascia. I'm putting a space in the line of colis fascia. Why is that? First, what is colis fascia? Colis fascia is a membranous superficial fascia. Such a terminology. Remember us with the fascia of the anterior abdominal wall. In the anterior abdominal wall, we said that the fascia is formed of a fatty superficial layer of camper and deep membranous layer of scarpa. Here also the fascia in the uh, urogenital triangle is formed of a fatty layer and deep layer. The deep layer is not called of a scarpa, just like the abdomen. It is called membranous deep superficial fascia of colis. Colis membranous superficial fascia. And you can see that uh, the fatty superficial fascia here continues above with the fatty superficial fascia of the abdomen. And even the colis fascia is continuous with that. So why I am putting here an interruption in the line of colis fascia. This is this interruption because here at this interruption the colis fascia continues with the muscle of the scrotum and penis and the fascia of the penis and I will show you that in that figure. This is the interruption of yellow spot that I had made. And this is the arrow which was pointing to the interruption. You can see that colis fascia is continuous with the muscle in the superficial fascia in the scrotum, which is called dartos muscle. And here it will be continue as colis fascia that extends into the penis, and here it extends and continues with the scarpus fascia of the interabdominal wall. So that's why I'm putting interruption between anterior and posterior aspects of the colis fascia. Because at this interruption, we must draw in that figure here the continuity with the scrotum, dartos muscle. If you remember, the dartos muscle is a muscle in the superficial fascia of the wall of the scrotum. This muscle when the condition, the environment is cold, it will contract. It is a muscle in the superficial fascia. 
and so the scrotum will elevate the testes up near the body to get heat. But if the environment is hot, the dartos will uh, automatically uh, relax and thus uh, let the testes away from the body to get cold. And so uh, you can see that the colleys, membranous superficial fascia, continues with the dartos fascia of the scrotum, which is a muscle in the superficial fascia of the scrotum. such an application carries a clinical significance. What is this clinical significance? Of course, uh, here I want you to see the deep perineal space and superficial perineal space in female. It is of the same configuration. This is the collis fascia in female. This is the inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, which is called perineal membrane in female. And this is the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, which is uh, in female. This is again a coronal section uh, to show the urogenital diaphragm in male. This is the uranar bladder, and that is the prostate. This is levator any, so this is the true pelvis. And in the perineum, this is superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, while this is inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. And uh, this is Collie's fascia. And so this is the superficial perineal space, while that is the deep perineal space. You can see that the deep perineal space contains sphincter urethral muscle. And the super superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm and inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm and the muscle the sphincter urethral muscle from the urogenital diaphragm. You can see that the urethra perforate the urogenital diaphragm. The same uh, configuration is seen in female. Uh, this is the uh, vagina or uterus, and this is the true pelvis, that is levator any, and you can see here the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, which is called perineal membrane, and this is the uh, deep perineal pouch, while well, this is superficial perineal pouch or space. You can call it pouch or space. And this is the colise fascia, the membrana superficial fascia, and that is the fatty superficial fascia. Uh, actually, this figure is very important, and that figure also, to enumerate contents, structures that are inside the deep uh, perineal space or pouch and structures that are inside the superficial perineal space in male and this is in female. And uh, I will show you a table for that and I will summarize that to you. This is the summary to contents of the superficial uh, perineal space or pouch in male and female. You can read it from here and depend on this figure and that figure. And also this is a content summary to the content of the deep perineal space. And you can depend on that figure and that figure for demonstration. Here also is a demonstration to the contents of the uh, superficial perineal pouch, specifically muscles in the superficial perineal uh, pouch or space. And I think it's very clear to be remembered. Yeah, you only you have to read it. Uh, I don't have to say it, uh, it's written there. And these are the contents of the superficial pouch, uh, and also you can read it, it's very easy in male and female. And this is a demo also for muscles and uh, glands in the deep perineal pouch, and you can read it very easily and you can remember it. I just want to help you, this is a revision, this is not an original lecture, theoretical lecture. So, I have said that uh, the topic of continuity of the collis fascia with the scrotum carries a clinical significance. What is this clinical significance? Well, just look to this figure. This is the symphysis pubis, this is the runner bladder, and this is the prostate. The prostate Below the urinary bladder contain part of urethra 
which is called the prostatic urethra, which is the first part of the urethra. Then the urethra pass into the urogenital diaphragm. This is the urogenital diaphragm. So supposingly, this is the superior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. And that is the inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. And what is in between them is the deep perineal space that is filled by sphincteric urethral muscle. And you can see that uh, the urogenital diaphragm formed by superior fascia, inferior fascia, and the sphincteric urethral muscle is perforated by the urethra, which is the second part of urethra. The first part is called prosthetic urethra, while this urethra in the urogenital diaphragm is called membranous urethra. Later on, the urethra will pass into the bulb of penis, which is called here bulbal urethra. So the urethra is prosthetic urethra and the prostate membranous urethra in the urogenital diaphragm and bulbar urethra in the bulb of penis. So what is the clinical point? The membranous urethra is very narrow and uh, it could be, it could not be dilated because it is surrounded by muscle, as you can see. Sometimes, for example, uh, due to uh, clinical reason, you have to introduce a catheter from the uh, external urethral orifice, a catheter, a urine catheter, and this catheter should be pushed down to the penile urethra, standing up, and then the catheter the catheter will reach the membranous urethra. So here there will be a resistance because the muscle contraction reflexly uh, and uh, preventing easily introduction of the catheter uh, into the urinary bladder. So if we do a certain force on this manipulation, we may rupture the urethra here. And after this rupture due to instrumentation by the catheter, or for example, sometimes we may have an endoscopic examination to the urinary bladder via the urethra. Uh, we may introduce an, en an endoscope there to see what's going on in the bladder, for example, cancer or else. So due to this instrumentation difficulty at the membranous urethra, the membranous urethra may be ruptured. So when the patient will urinate, the urine will pass from the prosthetic urethra out of the membranous urethra. This extravasation of urine and rupture of the urethra, the urine will be descend here. You know, this space is the superficial perineal space. It is between the inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, which is called perineal membrane, and colis fascia. So the urine, the extravasated urine, will fill the space here and even the scrotum will be filled and more urine will be accumulated um, deep to colis fascia around the penis and even it may extend deep to scarpa fascia of anterior abdominal wall. This is the clinical point of it. I hope I'm helping you in uh, describing uh, the anatomy of the uh, perineum in a practical aspect. I think it's uh, a rather complicated subject. The other point that I want you to know, you remember what is the perineal membrane, which is this one, the inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. This is superior fascia, and this is inferior fascia, which is called perineal membrane. Because this membrane is perforated by many structures, sometimes the lecturer needs to need you to uh, remember or enumerate structures perforating the perineal membrane, which is the urogenital, the inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. And I don't know, you have to go to your lecture. Maybe it is required from you or not, but this figure makes a demonstration for the structures perforating the perineal membrane, which is inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm. And you can see there that is, there is a space between the pubic symphysis and the uh, posterior, the anterior limit of, Euro, of uh, uh, perineal membrane. This space transmits the dorsal nerve and vein of penis 
or dorsal nerve and vein of clitoris. Uh, if you want a summary to read about uh, the structures perforating this membrane, this is the summary for the structures passing the perineal membrane or the inferior fascia of your genital diaphragm. So just you have to go to your lecture. It is uh, enumerated in your lecture, so it is required for you. You know, the lecture should be remembered with every detail. Thank you very much. I hope I'm, I'm helping.